you could join me today. I thought we would take a look at this older book, and it is called Country Life, The Fisherman's Companion by John Buckland. the river 
and oftentimes be very low, and some fish will actually jump out of the water to catch them. Five is a March brown fly, another aquatic insect that ends up flying. A mayfly, and this creature can be quite abundant when they emerge, and they usually all emerge around the same time, and that's considered a hatch. And a hatch is oftentimes when fish are quite excited, and a lot of fishermen will look for hatches because it draws in the fish. Seven is a jock scot, and these are what fly fishermen call flies because they're often made to imitate these other natural insects that come out of the water. Sometimes they're made to look like other minnows or fish, but they're quite artistic. Number eight is a pennels pattern, gold-bodied, so around the hook is gold streamer, and then you have feathers tied. Number nine is a brown palmer. It's a little bit smaller and more fuzzy. Ten is a stonefly, which is what a caddis is considered. A gray drake fly, a brown moth, a red spinner, a black gnat. Some flies are made to sit on top of the water, and some are made to be under the water. A willow fly and a whirling dun. This painting is by Charles Landseer, 17. 79. Salmon fishing at Eildon Hill. The fisherman is using a multiplying reel, often believed to be a more recent invention. So we can see some of the large hilltops in the background. And here we have a valley river. And you have a gentleman in his top hat and coat. And he has his rod and reel. And then we have someone accompanying him. Maybe he's the guide. And he has his Scottish hat on. And then you have the faithful dog companion, who is black with a brown snout. You have a fish lying on the beach. And this is also in tones of brown. Fishing for pleasure. As inward love breeds outward talk, the hound some praise and some the hawk. Some better pleased with private sport use tennis, some a mistress court. But these delights I neither wish, nor envy while I freely fish. The Angler's Song by Isaac Walton. And here we have a drawing with buildings in the background. And then the edge of the river almost looks like it's some type of canal. And then you have the fish on the line and the person with their hat and their coat and leggings and shoes. R. R. McKeon Spearing Salmon, 1848. A technique employing torch and lyster, usually five times known as 
is burning the water. Well, I've never heard of that before. Pretty interesting. Here it's dark and you have two fishermen. basket for the fish on their back. You have some fish sticking out of the basket. They have their vests and coats and kilts on and their socks and they're trying to spear fish and you can just see the outline here of one. This is his foot on a rock to give him leverage rocky outcroppings and a tree or shrub growing out of the rock. Mark what flies on the water, a drawing by James Thorpe from an edition of the Complete Angler, 19 So here we have greens and blues. This person is in their blue tunic with sleeves and their hat with a feather sticking out of it. And he has his satchel for his fly tying items. And then he has his basket on the back. White house with orange roof in the background and a little meandering stream. This is the title page of the first edition of The Complete Angler. So the title page looked like this, and it's a quite an ornate frame here that actually has fish curling around it with more fish hanging from its tail. <laughs> and then down below are fish curling around the bottom. And it looks like a clamshell. And it says the complete angler or the contemplative man's recreation being a discourse of fish and fishing, and discourse is spelled D-I-F-C-O-U-R-F-E, not unworthy, the perusal of most anglers, and perusal is spelled P-E-R-U-S, instead of the S, it's another F, so it looks like the F's in this are all supposed to be S's, Interesting. Simon Peter said, I go fishing. And they said, we will go with thee. John 21, 3. London, printed by T. Maxey, Burridge, Marriott. Is S. Dunflin's Churchyard of Fleet, 1653. <laughs> This page we have Dean Wollstonehall, 1798 to 1882, anglers playing their catch in a river landscape. Cloudy sky, and some greenery and trees. There's a gnarled weather worn tree with just a few leaves on the ends at the top. stream banks and some rocky outcroppings in the river. We have one fisherman here. This pole and he's holding the line by hand. No reels here. And here's another. He appears does not have a reel either. And is just holding his cane pole or whatever. And then there's another person sitting over here on the bank. Here we have a portrait of the contemplative angler, Isaac Walton, from a 19th century edition of The Complete Angler. And Isaac Walton looks to be in his 
brimmed hat and his white hair and his rather pilgrim looking collar and his jacket his pants and leggings his creel basket and here we have a real a hearty perfect one of the most popular fly reels ever made the first version of which was introduced in 1892 in this picture making silkworm gut in a Spanish factory about 1897. The product was purchased by Hardy Brothers, so gut would have been what they would have called fishing line back then. Hold fast sea lines. Here's an old, looks like advertisement for Farlow's hold fast line. side we have the notion that fly fishing for trout was an exclusively middle class sport is incorrect for many parts of England and all of Scotland. This fly fisherman of about 1857 has a long rod and no reel. I find that today people also think of this as an elitist sport and it really doesn't have to be. If you use basic equipment, it's just as effective. You have an open doorway. It's wood framed with a stone house behind. Then you have the first gentleman seated on a bench. And then there's a basket at his feet. And he's wearing boots and trousers and jackets and a hat and then there's another gentleman who seems to be in what I would consider a little bit finer attire and then a younger man or boy sitting on the stoop or the step in front of the house And then a small table with a pitcher and a glass on it. Here we have another, what looks to be either, illustration from an old book. Blacker's Art of Fly Making. An easy method of making a salmon fly. So the wing and head are tied on first. The hackle and tinsel are tied in at the shoulder, ready to be rolled to the tail. The hackle and tinsel rolled over the body and the fly finished at the tail. So here they worked their way back. Spur 
for body. If you wing it, take the tomtit tail and a small cocker and hackle, the color of a straw for legs, number zero or one for hook. The wings are a very dark blue, the color of new garth worn, the body of a dark bluey, dirty drab, with six legs of a straw color, the head of a dark ready color, to be fished one point and one top anger. Second edition of his book on angling, three pages of as nicely written, fly fishing matter as ever were penned. The Jenny Spinner. The transformation of this fly appears to have been unobserved or not cared for by the author. Nevertheless, it is a most beautiful, delicate, and deadly killing fly. A pattern is hereafter given. The nuthatch and the cockmerlin hawk have both good feathers for the wings of the iron blue, but perhaps no better feathers can be used than the dark blue ones from the breast of a well-plumaged water hen, two tips of which make first-rate wings. The hen merlin is double the sire of the cock, of a different color, and affords no feathers for this fly. Flies decoratively pinned with these red seals. Here's another impressive painting, Alfred de Briansky, The Letter Valley Above Bedwes and Coed, a tributary of the Conway. The leader's main reputation is for autumn salmon and sea wind or sea drought. The rocky background and river rocks in the and we have an angler here on this outcropping. This rod in the air and a pack on his back. Stream and we have trees, or a tree in this case, on the bank. A little print. We have quite a few of these old prints. Apparently this gentleman is so shocked to catch this fish leaping up out of the water that he about loses his hat off his head. Here is an advertisement. L-N-E-R Western It's quicker by rail. Full information from LNER and LMS offices and agencies. And in this painting, there is the swirling colors of white and blue and yellows and browns. And we have a fisher. is 
forested area with you have both pine and spruce trees as well as deciduous trees, rocks along the bank of two fish already landed on the bank, another one here in the water, and this very, very pale gentleman has his rod pulled back to try and bring in his fish, and he does have a small reel on the rod in his overcoat and vest and trousers and boots. Looks like he has knee-high boots that are tied, and then his creel basket. Here we have a few drawings of a man with a basket and a net and his rod. And these are from Lionel Edwards, 1878 to 1966, going for a John McNabb. And then we have this lovely painting where they are along a rather hilly or mountainous river, lots of large boulders, and here we have a woman with her hat and her brown coat and skirt matching leggings and shoes and her rod and reel and then we have a gentleman in his trousers and jacket and hat and he has his shotgun resting on his shoulder and then you have a black dog sitting here and then another that is white and brown Looks like a spaniel, maybe. And then up in the corner, it looks like we have a person or two that may be coming to join them. And this piece of artwork we have John Russell Castle, Grant Water, Rivers Bay, about 1870. Russell specialized in this subject, and no artist has painted salmon with greater devotion. It's quite a stunning scene with clouds either breaking or moving in. You have some blue sky. You have some rose hips up here. Some other vegetation. Rather hilly area broad, sandy-looking river, and then a still life of caught salmon laying on the bank. There's silver bottoms and dark gray tops, and then we have what looks to be maybe a creel laying here, and then a reel and Sir, doubt not, but that angling is an art. Is it not an art to deceive a trout with an artificial fly? A trout that is more sharp-sighted than any hawk you have named, and more watchful and timorous than your high-mettled Merlin is bold. From the complete angler, Isaac Walton. And here you have a... almost looks like a maybe cutting... There's two men in a boat. One of them has quite a large salmon on their fly, and the other is using a pole to bring it in. On 
sample of three different types of fish. And I was just going to say, I don't really have any idea which one is which, but they actually have them numbered on here. So this bottom one with the apricot colored belly and then spots on a very dark gray upper is the gray's jar. This one in the middle is Cole's jar, and it's more of a reddish belly, red-orange, with a dark gray or black top. And then the top is a Windmere jar, and this one almost looks to be a little bit more greenish gray on top, with the reddish speckles along the side. This painting is from Benjamin William Leader, Derwent Water, from 1868, The Loam of the Fantasme. You have the cloudy sky, light blue, and mountains covered in trees and shrubs, a small lane coming down along the riverside, fences along some fields, some cattle grazing in this low open area next to this lake or river. Then we have a gentleman with a pack on his back and rods and a young child and a dog black and white. And then we have their boat waiting for them tied up on some rocks. In this one we have Ogden Pleisner along the Granite Cliff, Moise River, Quebec. The 
Trout Stream, an American Northwestern River, from a Nathaniel Courier print, 1852. So I'm guessing that's a Courier and Ives. It's framed, and it says the Trout Stream. And then there's print that is quite small that I cannot read. <laughs> And then we have kind of a rocky area here, some outcroppings, and some trees on the banks, and on the outcroppings. And then we have two gentlemen in their blue coats, and one is wearing blue trousers, the other is wearing white trousers. And then some green grass while they're fishing. This one has a creel on their back. Here we have fly fishing in America, late 1860s. And it's rather a silhouetted picture. There's some waterfalls here with an angler fishing into that area. And then over here in the eddies, there's another one with a fish and someone reaching with a net to pick it up. And here we have three gentlemen catching a trout in a small flat boat. And this looks to be either a dam that's what it looks like behind them. The river that goes on. And then this area that's been dammed up for a lake, maybe. And they're catching the trout with a net. Got their rods. But no reels, it looks like. <laughs> some of these photos. Fish out here on the line and he's pulling it in. And again, he does have a reel on that. He has his creel on the side. for American Flies from the Printing Art, 1913. William Mills and Son, Extra Quality Trout Flies on O'Shaughnessy Looks, number 10.
here's a prepared dish of salmon a la chambord from Les Livres de Cuisine, circa 1880. It's quite done up with prawns and a fish, and I'm not sure what some of these things are, but looks quite fancy and attractive. <laughs> This painting we have a mature cock salmon fighting his way upstream. Illustration by Martin Nolden from the New Complete Angler, 1983. And here's a salmon that's rather pink along the sides in bronze colored yellow sun shining on the back of this fish. Trying to make it upstream through the rapids. Here we have a small picture of landing a salmon with a tailor, preferable to a gaff, though not to a large landing net. So here's the fish. This is interesting because this looks to be a photo that's been colorized. And so I'm guessing it was an old photo and then the colorization is like um, dots. You can see the actual dots on the print of a gentleman over here standing looking down at the fire. You have a little, it looks like an open faced cabin. And a lantern hanging. And then you have their string of fish hanging up. And then you have two gentlemen standing on either side looking at that. And they're rather large open baskets that are backpack type baskets. Here we go. The fish, as well as the rod, seems to have been larger in Victorian times. That is quite a large fish hanging with this gentleman who's well-dressed, and he's got his pipe in his hand, and he's got his bowler hat, and his large rod to have caught such a large fish. And then on this side, we have another courier and ives from 18. 72 salmon fishing and this looks to be in the mountains southwest some rapids a white canoe a young boy with a net and the fisherman Ogden Pleisner salmon fishing 1950 and this definitely looks to be in the mountains somewhere, somewhere high up because most of the trees are conifers. And they're in a canoe, one with a pole to help pull them along, actually two of them with poles. And then the person in the middle is the one fishing. You see a large, very large trout jumping out of the water. Oliver Kemp, Fishing in the American West, 1906 A moment all smoker anglers will recognize <laughs> So we have a gentleman who's trying to light his pipe And all of a sudden he's got a bite on his fishing line <laughs> Oh no, what do I do? He's standing on a rock, looking over at the fish. Walter Dendy Sadler, a village celebrity, 1883. Sadler was
was one of the most accomplished Victorian painters of fishing scenes. So you have kind of willowy tree here on the bank behind this gentleman who's seated either on a stump or a rock. Looks like maybe a rock. Has his creel around his side. He's sitting in a brown coat and a dark hat. He's got grayish sideburns, white collar, red tie. He has his pole, no reel. You can see at the edge of the bank all kinds of vegetation. are bright and deep where the gray trout lies asleep up the river and o'er the lee that's the way for Billy and me a boy's song by James Hogg and we have this painting by C.F. Dunnecliffe going up to spawn one of the illustrations from Henry Williamson's story Salo the Salmon, 1935. And this appears to be some mountainous in the background or large hills. But this area is a valley and a river. And this actually appears to be maybe a man-made dam because there is a structure here on the edge. And then the Salmon This painting is rather dark. William Garfit hatches on the Itchen. This is the river on which Skews evolved his theory of the nymph. So if you looked closely, you could see very light colored dots around that appear to be the hatch of some mayfly. It's a stream with grasses along the edge and then a bridge or a dam. Actually, looks like it might be a, a dam of some sort because it looks like there are openings at the bottom for the water to come through. This painting is by Alfred Debrianski, 1852. Evening after rain. And here we're high in the mountains, no trees to speak of on the mountaintops. We do have a few along the river bank here. We have people in a boat way out here fishing. And then you have two people here. They kind of look like maybe they're boys fishing rapids of this river. This is Thomas Spink's The Bridge Pool, 1876. It's a rather muted colors of a stone bridge over the creek. You can see a little bit of the reflection here. And then you have someone who's getting the fish off the hook. And then you have the angler here with his large pole. A casting competition. And it's a photo I'm going to say the early 20th century, maybe 1920-ish, and a woman in her jacket and skirt and dress. 
dress shoes is trying to cast her line out into the water. This painting is Here Bridge by F. Insall, 20th century. So.